to begin, before we get in the message, just by uh, saying Happy Father's Day to our dads that are here. You're not certainly not forgotten. Um, I, I was thinking about this this morning, really the importance of godly leadership in our home, in our homes, has never been greater. I, I know I look at the world that we're living in and ask myself, what has happened to our country? What is going on in this country? And really, I think a part of that is really the fruit of recent generations that's catching up with us and we're seeing it lived out in our culture. Obviously part of that is the rejection of God, the rejection of God's truth, uh, the replacement of true Christianity with humanism in our culture, but also the absence of spiritual leadership in homes, in families. And, um, and I'll tell you, to every dad and to every mom and to every leader in a home, our role is critical. I mean, we can't, we, it's not something that we can just expect other people to do in our place. It's our responsibility as moms and dads. And, uh, and really, I'm, I'm inspired, and I mean that, by dads that I see, especially dads because it is Father's Day, who are loving their families, who are loving God, who are leading their families in the right way. And I'll tell you, we, that didn't get much attention in our culture, but that's one of the greatest needs in our society is for stability in the home. And so thank, thank you, dads, and hope you have a blessed day. And remember that our role is important. And uh, some of us have, have uh, um, been around long enough that we don't have children living in our home with us. They have their own homes and we're enjoying the empty nest. I mean, we're surviving, surviving the empty nest. <laughs> but uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate families. I tell you, what a, what a mess our world is in today. Let's take our Bibles and look in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, uh, this morning. And we're going to begin reading where we left off uh, two Sundays ago in verse 28. If you're able to stand, I'd invite you to stand with us for the reading of God's Word, Mark chapter 10 and verse 28, where the Bible says, Then Peter began to say unto him, and we'll put this in the context in a moment, but Peter speaks to Jesus and says, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's, but he shall receive an hundredfold, now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. I want to focus our message today on four words of verse uh, 28, these four words, we have left all. That's what Peter said, lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And let's pray again and ask the Lord's help as we get in the scripture. Lord, thank you for the privilege we have today to assemble in this place, to lift our voices in praise to you, to worship you. Lord, to give you the rightful place in our lives and Father, we thank you for each one that's here. We especially thank you for the parents, the families, the dads in particular. We pray that you would just encourage us in this tremendous responsibility that we have in this day and age. And we ask you to bless as we study your word together. Open our eyes. Speak to our hearts. May we obey you as you prompt us, as you direct us, as you... Instruct us, and we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so Peter says to Jesus, Lord, we have left all and followed thee. Just taking that verse and following as we read it today, um, really 
doesn't even need any context necessarily. But I believe what Peter was saying was a response to what had happened a little bit earlier this in Mark chapter 10. Look in verse 21 and 22. We covered this some weeks ago. It had to do with the rich young ruler and uh, Jesus' conversation with him. But verse 21, Jesus beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come take up thy cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So here was this rich young ruler, as we covered uh, that week, who was not willing to give up the life that he enjoyed. He wasn't willing to get up what life he wanted. He wasn't willing to give up his possessions to follow Jesus. And so that, that had just occurred. And so it makes sense that Peter then would say, what about us? We have left all. And follow thee. Do you see the connection between those two events? And once again, it was Peter who spoke up. Surely the others may have been thinking about it, but Peter had a way of uh, just getting it out there so it could be talked about. And so he said, We've been willing to for forsake all. Think about this now. We've been willing to forsake all and follow you. They'd been following Jesus at this time for three years. And they weren't just following him in a token way. They had left their families. They still would see their families periodically as they traveled through Judea and Samaria and spent most of their time in Galilee. But they left their families. They left their homes. They left their occupations. We have a word-for-word -word account, for instance, where the sons of Zebedee left their father's shipping business and walked away with Jesus. Where Matthew, the collector, Matthew was sitting at the receipt of custom. And when Jesus said, follow me, he got up from his occupation and he walked away from that. And he began to follow Jesus. So they're, they're thinking about this. This man wasn't willing to follow you, but what about us? And in case you might think, well, I'm not sure that's what they were saying. I just want to give you a few words from Matthew 19 where Matthew wrote about this very conversation and when Matthew records behold we have forsaken all and followed thee he adds these words this is this what Matthew said that Peter added to that question what shall we have therefore so it's clearly a question about the rewards of following Jesus Christ or giving up whatever we had to give up to follow him and so for me it's a reasonable question if I could paraphrase, it's like Peter was saying, we just saw a man who was unwilling to give up what he wanted to follow you. What about those of us who have given up so much to follow you? So that was the question. That was the comment. And Jesus then elaborates on this in verse 29. If you look there again as we read a few more verses or repeat this verse, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. And he goes on to say he shall receive a hundredfold. We'll cover that in a moment. So Jesus begins with this word in verse 29, verily. It's a very interesting word. It's found many, many times in the gospel. Verily means of a truth. It is certain. It is a faithful saying. As a matter of fact, the word verily here is translated from the word amen that is transliterated into our English, amen. It means this is so. It would be like us saying, what I'm about to tell you is the truth, as though everything else we tell people is not the truth. He was emphasizing this. Verily, verily, he says in verse 29, I say unto you, there is no man... I have those two words circled in my Bible. There is no man. This applies to everyone. There is no one. Jesus said there is no one. Not one person. Not one who has given up anything for my sake in the Gospels. This didn't just apply to missionaries and pastors. This applies to everyone. When Peter said, what about us? We've given up our 
homes, we've given up our friends, we've given up our family, we've given up our occupations, we've given up our time, we've given up a section of our life. And Jesus said, Peter, not just you, but there is no man who has, in verse 29, left house or brethren or land, etc. You know, sometimes we think about in this context, and I certainly do, we think about missionaries, we think about preachers, we think about pastors, because we all know men, we all know people who have given up much for the gospel's sake, who've given up their time with their family. I think about, I was thinking about the Moore family, Bruce and Ann, uh, today, and the fact that they've chosen to live their lives, first of all in Central America, Nicaragua, now in Botswana, Africa, and sometimes we think, well, they must, you know, their family life must be different. No, they have feelings like we have feelings. They have family like we have family. They have relationships like we have relationships. And it's certainly true of them. They've given up so much. And we think about pastors that we know that have left family to serve in places and circumstances they never, ever would have chosen had it not been for the call of God. But this doesn't just apply to those people. This applies to all people. Any person, any, according to Jesus, any person who has left possessions and comfort and family and dreams to follow God's will, this applies to them. What about us, Peter said? What about us? Either last year, I'm not sure if it was last year or the year before, uh, in our Bible class here at CCA at Cornerstone, uh, I gave a series of lessons a kind of a biographical sketch of a man by the name of William Borden. And William Borden uh, graduated from high school in 1904. He was an heir to the Borden family. Borden Foods, many of you are familiar with the name Borden Milk. He graduated in 1904 for his high school graduation present, uh, present his uh, parents sent him as a 16-year-old boy on a trip around the world. And uh, he traveled through Asia, through the Middle East, through Europe. And as he traveled, he began to develop a burden for people, people who needed the Lord. He actually rode home while he was gone and told his family he was considering a life of being a missionary. When he came home, this young man, already a millionaire, young, wealthy, began his college education at Yale University. And he, it's a great story, and uh, I'm tempted to tell more of the details, but I'll refrain from that. But he stood out on campus. He began a Bible study of just a few hundred people, and by the end of the year, most of the student body at Yale University was studying the Bible with him. And during those days, he wrote this in his journal. Say no to self and yes to Jesus every time. After graduating from Yale, he did his graduate work at Princeton Seminary. But when he finished his studies at Princeton, he left for China. He left for China where he planned to work with the Kanzu people, a Muslim population in China. On his way to China, he stopped off in Egypt to study Arabic so he would be familiar with the language. But while he was in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis. And within a year, this 25-year-old was dead. This, this young man, a millionaire, literally, in his teens, is remembered for his Willingness to give up anything he could for the sake of the gospel. He's best remembered, and maybe you've read this before, by three phrases he wrote in his journal over the course of his life, these different stages of his life as a young man. The first was two words, no reserves. No reserves, everything in. The second two words were no retreats. No matter what, we're not turning back. The final two words were written after he was ill and knew he would not be able to continue, no regrets. 
I'm just, I say all that today to say that there are people, people we know of, people we don't know of, people all over the world who have given up things for the cause of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus is teaching this to his disciples, it was important for them to understand, you know, you're, you, we'll cover this in a moment, you'll be rewarded for anything that you have given up. But it's important for us to understand that as well. I believe today, and I can't prove this, but I believe today that there, there's, there are many people who at some point in their life, they struggle with following Jesus because it means I'm going to have to leave some things behind. And Jesus said, nobody has left anything for me that will not be rewarded. And maybe you've struggled in that way. Maybe as a young person you've thought about that. The challenge of giving up something you want. The challenge of giving up something that you would prefer. May I remind us all today that the call to be a disciple is a call to follow Jesus Christ. It costs something. It costs something to follow Jesus. You know, it's Father's Day and all of us, I hope, would appreciate, recognize the importance of family. And some people would say, well, family always must come first. But the reality is Jesus always must come first. Amen. Following Jesus is a life of obeying him and letting him have his way in our life. It's a lifetime of making decisions. Sometimes those decisions are easy. Sometimes those decisions are difficult. But we see in this passage that Jesus said, everyone, I refer you again to verse 29, no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel. And then he mentions this matter of rewards, verse 30, but he shall receive an hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. So what are these rewards that Jesus promised those who left things, left people, left convenience, left their own preferences in order to follow him? First of all, he said these rewards would be abundant. He said in verse 30, receive an hundredfold. Now that doesn't mean you're going to have a hundred houses and a hundred wives. Surely Jesus would not reward us with a hundred mother-in-laws. <laughs> but it means that he will reward them abundantly. The sacrifice to follow Jesus, whatever that sacrifice is, would be rewarded a hundred times more than if we had not followed him. Again, let's think about the, the, the conversation that preceded this conversation that, that caused Peter to ask this question. We're thinking about the rich young ruler again for a moment. He held on to his riches. He held on to his possessions. He refused to follow Christ. And that's what he had for his life. That's what he had to show for his life, his possessions. But he could have had his sins forgiven. He could have had a home in heaven. He could have had fellowship with God. He could have had a hundred times more if he'd been willing to leave those things in order that he might follow Jesus Christ. So what about these rewards? First of all, Jesus said the rewards will be in this life. And by the way, This is the greatest life there is. I'm talking about being a Christian. Some of you young people aren't convinced yet. But I'm telling you, if you ever come to the place that you're willing to deny yourself and surrender your all to Jesus, you're going to find out this Christian life is the greatest life there is. We have Christian friends, family, Christian family, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we don't even know all over the world, already in heaven. This is a great, great life. Now Jesus gave some balance to that in verse 30 when he says, 
He'll, be, he'll receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. And then he says this, with persecutions. Don't assume that it will not be without challenges. Don't assume that it will not be without difficulties. This life is a rewarding life, but it's going to have its share of conflicts. It's going to have its share of difficulties and challenges. But this life is not all there is. For he goes on to say in verse 30, And in the world to come, eternal life. The rewards are not just temporal. I would choose to be a Christian if this was all there was. He's given me a greater life. He's given me peace of mind. He's given me purpose. He's blessed us in so many ways. I would choose to be a Christian if this was the only life there is. But this life is not all there is. In the world to come. Now please hear me today because this is an important matter that Jesus included in this conversation about anyone who gives up anything for his namesake. And that is this. There are rewards that we will have to wait for. Their rewards will not see in this lifetime. Don't measure, don't measure God's blessing or God's reward by what you see alone. There are rewards you'll never see this side of heaven. Amen. Amen. When Jesus was writing, or when Paul was writing, excuse me, the church at Corinth, he said to those church members, I want to read this. Now he that planteth, He's talking about serving the Lord with your life. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And everyone shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Every man's work, this is not in this life, this is in the life to come. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. That will happen in the future. Our works, the things we've done, the sacrifices we've made, the investment in the work of God, that will all be tested by fire. And whatever, whatever abides the fire the fire we will be rewarded for that these rewards will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ that is the place that every single child of God will stand before Jesus and answer for the way we've lived our life in service to him and those rewards will not only be determined or revealed at the judgment seat But those rewards are going to determine, this will happen in the judgment seat of Christ, which I believe is happening during the great tribulation on this earth. And those rewards are going to determine our place of service in the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes back. After we have have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ and we have been rewarded according to the book of Revelation, we won't keep our rewards, we'll cast those crowns at the feet of Jesus. But then we're going to come back with him to this earth and we're going to reign for a thousand years with him. Based on what? Based on these very matters about rewards for what we've done for Jesus Christ. Look with me if you would in verse 31 where it says, But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. Many that are first shall be last. In the context... As we look at this in the context of this conversation, in the context, it appears to be saying, it seems certain to be saying that those who put themselves and their interest first in this life will be last. Many people do that. I'm going to put my interests first. I'm going to put my desires first. I'm going to put my will first. But Jesus said the first will be last. Those sometimes who put Christ first They put God's will first. They may be last in this world, but they will be first as far as God is concerned. There are those in this life, we know know them, we have known them, I know them. People come to my mind when I say this, who appear to have the least, 
But in heaven, they may have the greatest. I'm, I'm certain of this. There are going to be many surprises in heaven. I think there'll be many people in heaven, big shot preachers who think they were the end all for serving God and they're going to find out some little widow woman, some little humble servant of God is really the one that gets the greatest rewards in heaven. Many who've sought to be first will be last and those who are content to be last may be first in the kingdom of heaven. And what, and I'm going to end with this thought, and what is the motivation for living this way? Notice what it says in verse 29. I want to read this again. It says, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands. Here's the motivation. Here's the reasons. For my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Does the Bible say that we ought to serve him so that we can be rewarded? And the answer to that is no. We don't serve him so we can be rewarded. Well, what is the reason then? What is the motive? Why would a person, why would a person give up their time? Why would a person give up their dream? Why would a person like William Borden give up his place as a millionaire? Why would a person like these many missionaries that we would serve, why would they leave their family? They love their family just like we love our family. Why would they leave their family? Why would they leave what I still consider to be the greatest nation in the world to go live in some other place that doesn't have what this country has to offer? Why do they do that? And the answer is clear here in verse 29. Jesus said, for my sake and the gospels. Jesus said, whoever does this for my sake, because of Jesus, because it's God's will, because of their love for Jesus, because of their devotion to Jesus, because of what Jesus means to them, because they want to please him, more than they want, they have a flesh just like you and I have a flesh. They have fleshly desires, carnal appetites, just like we do. They, they have things they'd rather spend their time on, just like we do. But why would they give it up? They give it up for Jesus' sake. They give it up because they love Him. And they give it up for the gospel's sake. The gospel, the good news. Because of what the gospel means. Because of what the gospel has done for them. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that Christ died for us. The gospel is what changed our life. The gospel is what brought us out of darkness into light. The gospel is what regenerated us and made us new creatures in Jesus Christ. We didn't get reformed. We got born again because of the power of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. We don't obey Jesus Christ in order that we might be saved. We obey him and serve him because he has saved us. He has forgiven us. He's redeemed us. He has accepted us into his own family. He's washed us. We owe a debt to the gospel. All of us do that are saved. The gospel salvaged our lives. Because the, the gospel is not just for us. It's for everyone. It's for the whole world. We do it for his sake and the gospels. Because of his command to take the gospel to every creature. In every nation. Around the world. I'm sure people wonder, why do Christians give up so much? By the way, Christians should be known as givers. Not just giving money, that's a part of it, but giving their time, giving their lives. This is the reason why. This is why people give their time to serving the Lord. This is why people give their money for the work of God. Not because it's easy, not because it's convenient, not because it's popular, not because it'll earn them points with God. They do it for His sake and the Gospels. 
if you would take that and just kind of look at it from a different direction as I was thinking about this this morning why do people quit serving the Lord why do people start serving the Lord and quit serving the Lord is it because of all God's work is done no is it because there's so many laborers we're not needed anymore not quite why would a person you know it's not a lack of hours in a day that a person cannot manage to give time and effort to the work of God I would suggest it's because a lack of love in our hearts for Christ and the gospel People who love Christ will find a way. People who love the gospel will find a way because it's important to them. You know, after Jesus raised from the dead, he had this very familiar conversation with Simon Peter after Peter denied him three times. This was the point that Jesus kept driving home to Peter. If you love me, feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? I'm, I'm, I'm think, still thinking about this question. Why do people quit serving the Lord? It's not because we get too old. There may be some things we cannot do that we once did, but there's still things we can do. It's not because we're too busy. Everybody's busy. I'll tell you, sometimes it's because we just don't. The, the, the Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the gospel don't mean to us what it ought to mean to us what is the motivation for doing this now let's just put all this back together and we'll wrap this up Jesus had a man come to him who said what must I do what must I do that I might inherit eternal life and Jesus challenged him about his obedience to the law And Jesus said this because he knew that this man put too much emphasis, too much stock on his material possession. So Jesus said, I'll tell you what you do. Go take everything you have, sell it, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Now that'd be a lot to ask a person to do, wouldn't it? But look what he got in in return for it. He got to be a follower. He would be a follower of Jesus Christ. Nothing in this life is more important than being a follower of Jesus Christ. And this man was grieved in his heart. Walked away because his possessions meant more to him. And then Simon asked the question, Lord, what about us? I'm sure he's thinking in his mind about the day he walked away from his family, walked away from his livelihood. And again, that doesn't mean he didn't ever get to see them again. It just meant he was going to be committed to following Jesus, whatever that meant. What's going to happen with us? And Jesus said, no man. Nobody who ever gave up their Sunday afternoons to go to a nursing home. Nobody who gave up their Saturdays to go visiting. Nobody who ever gave up something they could have been doing because they would prefer to do what Jesus wanted. Nobody, no man ever gave up anything for my sake in the Gospels that he will not be rewarded both in this life and in eternity. For those in this room, and it's a big percentage of people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about, be encouraged today. God is aware of everything done in his name and for his glory. The world may not look at it and appreciate it. The world, even our own family and friends may not look at it and appreciate it. But the one who matters most, he's keeping good records. Thank God for that. And you know what? I want to finish my course with joy, don't you? And you say, how are we going to do that? Just keep loving Jesus and loving the gospel. That's why we do it. You may have known someone in your lifetime. Perhaps you have. Maybe you've heard of someone or maybe you never 
crossed your mind people who kind of get discouraged and quit because nobody notices what they're doing. Nobody recognizes what they're doing. That may seem real in their head, but it's not true. Because the one that matters most recognizes what we're doing. Thank God for that. The words of Jesus ought to motivate us to give him our lives. To give him our lives. No doubt there are people right here in this room today who've never truly repented and put their faith and trust in Christ, believed on Jesus Christ for salvation. I'm telling you today, the greatest life there is is the life of a child of God. Don't make the mistake of thinking, well, I'm afraid if I get saved, then God's going to make my life miserable. No. You get saved, and he'll give you abundant life. If you're here today and that's you, maybe you're a young person, a teenager, an adult, but you're not sure for sure, I'm talking about certain, that you belong to Jesus Christ. You ought to come to Christ today. I'll be standing right there at the front in a moment. You ought to come down here and say, I want somebody to talk to me about this. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I have a lot of regrets, but I'll tell you something I'll never regret. And that's the day that I put Jesus Christ first in my life. And I said, Lord, I want you to save me and change my life. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And there are people here today, you need to make that decision. I can't make it for you. You have to make it on your own. It, it's possible, I, I think this is a possibility, that there are people who are saved. who have not really fully surrendered themselves to Jesus Christ to follow him and might be wondering, what if I give him my life? What do you think William Borden thought after he left his fortune, millionaire, a young man, and, and had the realization living there in Egypt that his life was about to come to an end because of the decision he made to follow Jesus. We don't have to wonder what he thought because he wrote those two words, no regrets. No regrets. The more you give to Jesus of your time, your life, your devotion, your love, the better you're going to be. I would challenge you today, not, not say, well, I'm going to think about this. And if you need to think about it, think about it. But for most people, we don't have to think about this. It's the natural response. And I challenge you today, young or old, today, say, Lord, I want to give you my life. I'm not going to give you my life with reservations. I'm not going to give you my life with restrictions. I'm going to give you my life. Here at this altar, there at your seat, wouldn't it be a great day on this Father's Day to say to your Heavenly Father, for Jesus' sake and the Gospels, I'm going to give you my life today. I promise you, he'd be pleased with that.